So um, I've got some questions. I'm going to introduce the panel in a second. Uh, I've got some questions can lead us through this, but uh, we do have time to open it up to for you as well. Um, Tom Wheeler, uh, who used to be CTIA guy and now is FCC chairman, head honcho, right? He said he's going to pay $10 for every person who offer, off, asks a question on this panel. And he'll mail you a check. So he did. He told me that. Uh, checks in the mail. So, OK, so we're going to talk about mobile video and specifically about advertising. Um, uh, I'm, I have a company called IGR. We do market research. Um, I can tell you that 60% uh, of the mobile data used is for video. I can tell you that young people use it incessantly. I can tell you I have two millennials, a 19-year-old and a 21-year-old, who think that LTE and Wi-Fi are completely the same thing. And if one's not fast enough, use the other one. Don't worry about the bill. Dad pays for that. And uh, my son, um, my 19-year-old, he's moving into an apartment uh, next week, actually, for college. And this summer, he bought himself a LED 50-inch smart TV with 4K and a Blu-ray player and an Apple TV. He was working all summer. He could afford it. What's interesting is he's now spent his summer looking for 4K video content. Because he's got this cool TV, he's been searching the web looking for this stuff. So my question to him was, well, when you get to college, how are you going to connect to the internet? He's like, <laughs> Wi-Fi, of course, Dad. <laughs> I said, well, what are you going to do if the Wi-Fi is not you know, available fast enough? He said, use this. Just uh, hotspot it, connect it to the TV. There's no problem. 4K video over an LTE connection to a 50-inch TV. So I can watch my 35 gigs a month just disappear into the sunset in about three seconds. So, so we have a generation coming to whom mobile video is normal. To them, it is TV. It's like TV was when I was growing up, and it is completely normal to them. So within that context, you put in advertising and promotion, and of course, you end up with where we're talking about today. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce the panel very quickly, and then I'm going to give them each two or three minutes each to introduce themselves uh, more fully, what they do, what their company does. Um, and the question I have for them to start off is, what is the one thing we've learned from the first forays here into mobile advertising? So um, uh, Keith O'Neill from L4 Digital, Brooke Bobe, Got it right. From Pinsight. And uh, Andrew Gerhardt from Airsurf. See, I didn't have to look. I remembered him. So uh, Keith, you want to start? Who you are, what you do, and first lessons. Sure. Keith O'Neill, one of the co-founders of L4 Digital. We're a digital product agency, so we work with a lot of brands, helping them build the products that people use to view and consume video and other types of content. I think the. Uh, the biggest lessons learned over the last, we'll call it, since 2008 when the smartphones really started to take off and we saw an evolution of a, a rather quick migration from people viewing content on web to people viewing content on their phones was they're different. Um, the initial uh, tendency was to apply uh, technologies and ways of interacting with consumers from web and that was met with you know a lot of friction it wasn't very successful which then resulted in a lack of uh, monetization of those properties and it took a while for technology to evolve and for new um, new products to come out to enable um, the true monetization of the platform and so I think the the biggest thing is technology is a wonderful thing but it takes time for us to figure out how to use it correctly for a specific device like mobile. Have, have we learned? Are we using it properly today? Are we still learning? Better. It's still evolving. OK. Right. Brooke? Uh, my name is Brooke Bove. I'm the head of business development for the West Coast for Pennsite Media. Uh, Pennsite Media is a wholly owned Sprint subsidiary that focuses on the monetization of data, advertising, and distribution or user acquisition. Okay. And then in terms of me, for the things that I learned about mobile advertising when I first got into it, um, I would say 
quality in everything you do. So quality and the data that you choose to use, uh, it being first party, there's so much tremendous value. Um, if you're a publisher or a developer, quality in the content, um, users are always going to come back to quality content. Uh, quality in ad placement, so if your app or publishing site looks like the Las Vegas Strip, you're doing something very wrong. <laughs> um, and so I would just say quality in everything. Okay, great. Andrew? My name is uh, Andrew Gerhardt with AirServe. AirServe is a mobile SSP, which means supply side platform. Essentially what we do is we help mobile app developers and publishers monetize their audience, monetize their inventory through primarily mobile video ads. Um, when we entered the space a couple years ago, what we found is how immature it is. I think similar to what Keith mentioned, there's a big disparity between what's available for marketers and advertisers, the way that they can advertise to the audience, and what's actually happening. What they're actually doing is taking creatives from television, and that doesn't really resonate in a mobile environment. So I'd say that's the primary thing. Okay, so uh, we'll start with you. What What's working today? I mean, what, what's, what is mobile advertising today? Is it uh, insertions in video? Is it YouTube on, you know, I, I look at YouTube, I see the banner ads along the bottom. Is it, uh, what does it look like? Well, it's a lot of things. Um, it's banners. It's, today it's a lot of banners and interstitials. It's moving towards mobile video. That's what's working well. All the data and statistics uh, back that up in terms of where advertising dollars are being spent and where they're transitioning into. Uh, what we see is opt-in advertising working really well. So if I'm in a game and I can no longer continue with the gameplay, I may be rescued by uh, a, an advertiser. I may be able to continue the gameplay if I watch a video ad. It's a very, very successful way of advertising. Uh, so we see a lot of that happening. We see native video working pretty well. Basically anything that allows the user to opt into the advertising instead of it being thrust upon them works pretty well. Okay. Right. What, what do you see is working, Brooke, today? Um, I, I would agree with everything Andrew said. And um, one of the things that we're hearing from our advertisers or the agencies that we work in or work with is that they are very interested in sponsored content. So just really seeking like that more native experience on a device with a publisher. So we're trying to, we're, we've been really putting a lot of focus on curating those type of experiences. So does that automatically lead to um, having to create new content? So I mean, I know Verizon with Go90 has talked about you know, Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck creating new content for them. So like the uh, Netflix House of Cards, do you need new content for it or can you have existing content that you sponsor? Uh, I think it can be either. So I think it really depends on who your advertiser is and who your publisher is and making a very native feel. So a lot of times we'll work with publishers that maybe have some interesting facts that so we can weave in an interesting fact about a brand that users just aren't familiar with, and that's something that to really get them engaged with the brand. Okay. Right. Just to add on that, though, yeah. I think that creating content specifically for mobile is super important. And it comes back to the creatives. We were talking to an agency in Boston just this week where just talking to them about what might work, uh, the same 30-second spot which has the engagement point at the end of the video ad, it's not going to work in a mobile environment where you have to capture me right away. So the brands and the agencies have to get used to creating something for the mobile environment, which the users are uh, engaging and acting differently. So we've done a lot of uh, work this summer on millennials. Eight, we actually surveyed and interviewed 18 to 25 year olds. And I didn't do it because I'm too old. But I had my son do it, the 19 year old. And um, we asked them, one of the questions we asked them was, what is TV? And they say, whatever you're watching on whatever screen, wherever I am. So they said, some of them said, well, TV is, we call it the TV, but really what you're asking me is, what is my entertainment to my content? And it's everything. So watching uh, original content on a mobile device, I think to a lot of, to older folks, is like, are you crazy? I can't see it. Um, but on the plane today, flying in this morning, I'd say half the people on the plane were watching uh, video on an iPhone Plus size device, not a tablet or a laptop. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's an interesting, um, uh, it's going to be an interesting medium. It's going to be interesting. So, Keith, what works today? Give us some examples of uh, you know, where it's going. I think um, both uh, Andrew and Brooke are correct in the fact that 
it's really about the experience that the consumer's having. So companies and platforms that enable the best user experience, whether it's an ad or even the product itself, are the ones that are seeing the best results. From a adverti mobile advertising standpoint, we're seeing, with the products we've been involved in creating, we've, we've seen hands down video perform the best of anything, but we're also seeing the emergence of some new innovative types of, of ad units in native elements that can pop up and interact with a consumer and they can put in a, you know, shelve it for, to review later or partake in a special offer from within the experience without leaving, and we're seeing those start to gain some traction as well. It's, it's, if it feels good to the consumer, they'll interact with it if it's meaningful. Otherwise, they just dismiss it. Okay. Do you see an age, uh, I mentioned my kids, me. Um, I'm not a big advertising guy, they are, because they can get free stuff. <laughs> Do you see a big age difference? I mean, is it, is it a typical you know, 30 year old male Type demographic sports now that they're targeting? What, what do you see? Well, you're not an advertising guy, but it probably depends on the ad, right? right. You, you may not be an advertising guy because the ads were either poorly targeted or just bad ads. Right. But if it was, and I don't know what you're interested in, but if it was something that you were, interest, if you were interested in a, a luxury car or a sports car and you saw an ad for that, you'd probably watch it, right? right. So it's about the quality of that advertising, not necessarily the advertising. Yeah, I, so I think that's what matters. So my son, I've watched him play the iPad. He'll watch video after video, because you mentioned he wants the free stuff. He doesn't care what it is. So it's not as much about the targeting. And to me, that's inefficient advertising. Finding out who you are and what you're interested in, and then giving you an ad that caters to that, that's where it begins to work and make sense. But, yeah. yeah. I, I agree 100%. It is not a one size fits all. It's about the personalization. Um, understanding your product and making sure that the, the ad units that you're putting into your product, video or other, align with your, de your target user. Um, for me, I would say that one thing that we put a ton of stock in is our first party data and being able to really match the right audience to a brand, so that's super important for us. The second thing is we've made investments this year um, in two new ad units that kind of target a younger demographic. So one is an interactive emoji that goes into a messaging client, and then we're also getting ready to release a polling ad unit that we think are gonna hit like different demographics. Okay, so I was actually gonna ask you what role the operator plays in your business, because obviously you're part of Sprint, mm -hmm. right? So is it a case of being able to target, as, uh, as I've said, you know, the specific demographics? Or how, does, how does the Sprint data or the operator data play into this? Yeah, sure. So if you think about our data set, or if you think about the data set from a carrier, it's extremely rich. So, I mean, extremely rich in the, the location set. So we see a lot of um, folks in advertising who have no relationship to a carrier tell you they have all these data points. Well, what they really mean is they have data points when they're in an app. Nobody's using an app, or shouldn't be using an app if you're driving, those kind of things. And we have that always on location information, which our data sets are extremely rich. Um, so from a carrier perspective, we're also looking at kind of behavioral type data, all on an opt-in basis, but that's gonna be browsing behavior, uh, different apps that you have on a phone. Um, and then we also actually work with additional other carriers as well, so. Okay, so, so you're, you're carrier agnostic then, even? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I won't ask you what phone you have. <laughs> Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? 10 bucks from uh, Tom Wheeler to everybody who asked the question. No? We can keep going, I've got more here. All right. Um, five years from now, can an operator uh, be in the wireless industry without having a revenue stream from some sort of advertising, sponsorship, content? And I realize I'm asking the sponsorship, advertising, content guys, so. I think I know the question, but you want to start? Well, I actually view it as, the, the question really is, what's next for the operator, right? Because they, you know, as Brooke has pointed out, they're providing a lot of data, they're helping people target, we're learning a lot about different users and how to be personalized in the offering that we're presenting. But that, that begs the question, is it enough? Are people going to adopt that? Are, do they see the value in it? Which is why you see a lot of these operators, and I think you're going to see more and more of it start to happen they're acquiring and starting to own content companies. And by doing that, 
they control the content, they control the ads, they can actually provide a much better experience and a better monetization model because they have access to all of it. Right. And so I see, I think you're going to see more and more of that consolidation continue to happen over the next five years, which is, you know, what AT&T has done with DirecTV, Verizon with AOL, and so on and so forth. Yep. I don't have anything to add. I think he's right. I mean, I, I don't know as much about the operator space as maybe Brooke does, but it might not be to me whether they can, but why they want to ignore it. There's such an opportunity for them with the data they have and the, the audience that they can reach. It seems like revenue left on the table. Yep. Um, I certainly believe in it, the, my future, <laughs> so. Um, I would say that the acquisitions alone in the space this year kind of speak for themselves. So I think that carriers are investing money in this space and they think there is going to be a future here. Um, I think the data sets alone, how rich they are, there's so many things you can do. And then I'm also a huge um, fan of personalization. So, and, and that's what um, some of these rich data sets bring to you is opening up a device and having a really personalized experience. And I think those are all very positive things. Okay. Um, ad blockers. Uh, we see them on the internet. We see them in mobile, actually. And from the work we've done, there's more ad blockers on mobile phones than there are on desktops. Simply because you've got a bigger screen, you know, you don't notice anything happening at the side. You've got plenty of real estate, but on my my phone, it's a little crunchy. So, how do you, how does the industry look at you know the advertising industry look at the ad blocker? Um, several of you mentioned opt-in and things like this, sponsored content, original content. Is that the way to address that phenomenon? How, how do you look at them? You're nodding, so only a few first. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it a lot internally and with customers, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into, people are, people are installing ad blockers in desktop, they're installing them in mobile web, it hasn't really impacted in-app yet, maybe it will in the future, but it hasn't gone there yet. But we have to look at why they're doing it. They're doing it because it's sucking up their data, we do it because they're, they don't like some of the ads that are following them around, they call them, you know, quote unquote, creepy, right. or the technology's not working properly. Um, because of the way the ecosystem is constructed, so there's too many tags on the page, and it's there's speed concerns, so there's lots of, and maybe just poorly targeted ads, those are things we can address and resolve. So advertising is not going to go away. I think that ad blocking is, I, I don't foresee it hap um, I don't foresee it sticking around for the long term. I think that as an industry, we have to ad adjust the way that we're um, advertising to the consumers to eliminate those concerns that they have. Right. I, I think that we're going to see, I, I agree with Andrew, and we're going to continue to see innovation around ad tech that's going to enable for better ad units, more targeted, more personalization, better experiences. I, ad blockers, just like spam filters, are the result of consumers having a really bad experience and people capitalizing on that with, by building a product to sell to make the experience better. So I right. think if, if the ad experience evolves and ad tech continues to innovate, you'll see more and more pe willingness to interact and view ads because it'll be an accepted part of the experience. Okay. Um, I actually completely agree with Andrew on this and I think the reason that we talk about ad blocking is because bad actors in the ecosystem. Um, and I think that as an advertising ecosystem and developers, publishers, everyone that's involved, we all have a stake in preventing or stopping this. So, I mean, if you're a publisher or a developer, back to the Las Vegas Strip example I used earlier, don't do this kind of thing, because it's going to drive your consumer to not want to use your product. Um, if you're a publisher, don't allow for advertisers that are just not quality, because this is another thing that is going to really annoy consumers and not want to use them, want, not want them to interact with that. Right. It was interesting when we spoke to the millennials, they, they actually, they, you know, they realized there's good content, there's bad content. Good content with advertising, they will take because they want the content. Bad content with advertising, no, don't want it. So it's it's not the advertising; it's the quality of the content they want to get to. It also hasn't reached a, a tipping point yet. So I was at another conference recently where a woman in the audience was probably 65 or 70 years old, and she said she used an ad blocker, and on you know regular sites, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. But it hasn't gotten to the point where those websites have blocked her from using the site. Right. When it gets to that point, then something will change. Then yeah. she's either going to have to pay for the content or yeah. enable the ads. But it can't be that you want to 
use my game or read my content, but you're going to take away my revenue stream. Right. It, it just doesn't jive. My mother hasn't realized you can get the internet from, a, from her iPhone yet, so that lady is pretty advanced. She'll get there. Yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> Photos from the grandkids, that's different, right? So, any questions? Yeah. 10 bucks. 10 bucks. <laughs> Tom Wheeler, checks in the mail. So uh, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about uh, has to do with on-demand content. I was wondering if any of you have done work with live video presentations. And what, do you have business models around that? Do you have plans around that? What do you think about live video? And how do you deal with ads for a live video event, even something like a Facebook Live event that might last for five or 10 minutes? Do you have any plans or thoughts around that? We have, we have some customers who have apps that do live video, and they typically will either uh, use pre-roll ads, short pre-roll ads that are you know, 7, 15, 30 second ads that show before the event, or it could be something that is uh, scheduled to be within the event, so maybe at a specific point, or it could be post-roll. So there, there's ways to do it, yeah, I think, tra like traditional television. I think um, it is a, uh, it's an acceptable scenario to have ads in your live video stream. The, the trick is making sure that you have a technology platform that supports the insertion of those ads. We've done work with a couple of big broadcasters and media companies that have that. It's fairly, you know, it comes from the broadcast side of the world. They're fairly adept at doing it. But it's an accepted um, way of monetizing product. Consumers don't have a backlash to it because they're, they're very accustomed to it. But it's, again, the technologies for the average, you know, kind of content delivery mechanism to do it isn't quite there yet. There's some challenges with it where you have to really think about the content, the scheduling, doing pre-roll, post-roll, you know, dynamic ad insertion in the middle of, the con of a live feed becomes a real challenge. Uh, I would just add to that from an advertiser perspective, they love pre-rolls. So if you're thinking along those lines, I would encourage you to look at that format. Okay, great. Any other questions? One in the back. Hey guys, um, so my question is on attribution. So as you look across channels, right, like the thing we haven't even touched on right now is conversion. So as you're building out ad tech, can you talk like the next iteration of attribution where you see that going across device and how marketers can you know, get smarter about where they're spending their money? Thank you. Keith, do you want to start? You're looking like you. Sure, I'll, I'll start with that one. I think you're you're absolutely right. And if, you know, one of the questions I know is, is up and coming, so I'm going to be a spoiler a little bit. Is what are we going to look? What do we think that we're not doing enough of today? And it is that cross-platform. You know, today most consumers, as um, Ian alluded to, they're starting to think of them just as digital endpoints. Why can't I watch my content on any screen anywhere? And then it comes down to having the, the ad platforms that can actually support that multi-screen experience, which is not trivial because you're tracking. The tracking around it becomes a real challenge because you're, you're hopping from one to the other and you need that, those handoffs to be in play. Now where we're seeing some of the innovation is there's some companies starting to do some things around leveraging the mobile presence as a way of identifying and having that feedback loop for where a consumer is, not necessarily the, as the consumption device, but as the way of knowing, okay, we're handing off from one screen to another so that we can have a personalized experience across multiple screens. We can have ads that are consistent from at least from a type of ad perspective across the multiple screens. And I think that's an area we're going to see a lot of innovation over the next couple of years. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would say that that's something that we're looking at as a company, um, the cross channel, cross screen. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but definitely it's on the near term roadmap for us. You know, we, we, we as a company have been focused on cross-screen stuff. I will say that I think that that's why Google and Facebook are doing so well, is that because they have the login data, they know where you are, they know that you're logged in on your desktop, your device, they can tie everything together. That's why they're winning in that space, and other people don't have that same opportunity at scale. Uh, so the challenge is there's, there's companies that offer cross-screen solutions, but they're more probabilistic. They're not, they don't have that same access that somebody like a Facebook does. Okay, good. Uh, there's another question in the back. So we're going to keep with the Q&A for a little while, or did you yeah, just need to jump back in? Okay. Yep. Run, 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 run. 
us. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, my question was with malware and file sizes becoming so large in advertising, is there any uh, plans in place to start restricting those things from being attack vectors for malware and data drains? The tech question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we could talk about some of the stuff that we do. So we work with a couple of different vendors uh, around malware detection. They're, they automatically scan tags and look at creatives within the ad server to be able to block them in real time. And so there's definitely things. It's, it's a large concern for app developers and publishers, and we try to be at the forefront to block those things because it's a big concern. Uh, and then in terms of file size, uh, you just have to have the technology in place to be able to uh, read the creatives and serve the thing back to serve the uh, specific creative back to the device that's optimized. Uh, so we have the tech in place, you just have to build it up. Okay. I, I think Andrew kind of covered it. I, th there's a lot of tech kind of evolving around the right content to the right device, background downloads and into a temporary cache so you're not consuming a whole bunch of storage on it and then doing an optimized format. Um, and then as far as the malware stuff goes, a lot of that also, I, I, and I encourage everybody, do your homework on your selection for your, your ad platform because a lot of them, you know, they, as, as uh, Andrew has said, they, the, the right platform will protect you from a lot of those types of issues. Yes, yeah, so, uh, for us personally, we use a third party company to uh, detect these kind of bad ad experiences and block them. Right, great. So, uh, kind of a follow on question here if we had uh, the CTOs of the major carriers sitting here and Apple and Samsung, so we had all the carriers and all the devices, <laughs> right? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. ACC, a few other folks. What would you want from them? What, what would you tell them, you need to do this to your network, you need to do this to your device? Ideal world, what would you, uh, what would you want? I think Android is too messy. Uh, too Apple, messy. Apple is very clear cut, simple, in a box, easy to develop for, distribute to. Android is a mess. Uh, and so I think it poses challenges for developers and for people trying to develop on, the, on that platform. Okay, anything for the carriers? Clean up Android. Yeah, I'm not sure yet. Get, everybody's got an old Android phone, give them a new one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I, I mean, for us, we do a lot of work on Android devices. Um, we have some um, placements that we sell on device, on Sprint devices to help developers acquire users. So that, that's great for us from a carrier perspective. Um, so I think that's something that we work, we also work with other carriers on similar solutions. Mm -hmm. So we can definitely go deeper and do more on the Android platform. Um, I know that they are all opening up some different opportunities for third party developers. I'm excited to see that. Um, specifically the interactive emoji that I talked about earlier, that's something of a way that we can play with um, iOS devices going forward. So I'm excited to see all the APIs opening up and things like that. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think Google is kind of, with the Android platform, has already started recognized that they created a nightmare for people and they've been course correcting ever since. You know, I mean, when we develop product now for people, there's a lot of acceptance to start with an Android 4.3 and higher because of the capabilities of the platform, because of the ease of delivering to those platforms. It's when you go into you know, markets where you have an abundance of these older devices that you run into a lot of the problems today. But if you're on Android 4.3 and higher, you can you can do most of what you want to do. Um, it becomes a lot easier. I think on the carrier side, the biggest challenge that you run into with any connected product is network consistency. And when you have you know, troubleshooting and figuring out how to have diagnostics in place that automatically help the product quality and, and um, have failovers for that, I think is something that we need to see evolve because it becomes a real expense for product companies putting out mobile products to uh, that work on mobile when they have those types of problems and the customer support calls are 20 bucks a pop and they're trying to right. solve real issues. Right. Interesting. No, none of you said speed. Faster networks, which is, you know, I'm an old telecom guy, so I, I got excited about 14.4 kilobits <laughs> you know, and Blackberries. And I thought it's interesting you went to the devices, you talk about network consistency, but not necessarily speed, but you, you you obviously went to the device first, which is interesting. So, devices, networks must be good. So, uh, any other questions? Tom just texted me, 20 bucks. <laughs> Checks in the mail. 
So, so we do still have a little bit of time with our panel of industry leaders here. Uh, so don't be shy if you'd like to ask a question. Now is a great opportunity to do so. These panels were created for you to be able to interact and ask these questions. And if they're on your mind, they're probably on someone else's mind too. So I'll give you a couple more minutes to think about if you have any questions. Otherwise, I assume that our panel would be willing to hang out at the side of the stage for a couple one-on-one -on -one questions yeah, for shy we, people. I, there's a few more questions I have as well. We can start to wrap it up. So Wonderful. OK, okay. well, right. then Ian's got some questions for us. Right. And you guys keep thinking thinking about things you might want to ask towards the end. Okay. So uh, we've got a few minutes. Um, when uh, ad agencies, companies, brands come to you guys, is it mobile has to be in the mix? Is it mobile is the first consideration in an ad, in an ad campaign? Or are other things, other digital media out there first and then mobile is still the afterthought? So what we typically see is it varies uh, with a large, large agency. Uh, they'll have different divisions for mobile, which actually is part of the problem. It's very fragmented. So you have a creative director who will then design something and then he ships it off to the mobile department and ships it off to the desktop department and ships it off to the TV department. Um, and so it's very fragmented in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and that's a problem. Uh, with a smaller agency, they really don't know what they're doing in mobile and so they want to manage service and they just want <clears throat> to reach their audience and get some sort of performance on the back end. Right. Okay. But uh, I, again, I think this it depends. Um, if you're coming to work with us directly and seeking <laughs> us out, you're coming to us because we are experts in mobile. That's our strength. That's where our richest data set is. Um, that's where we drive like a unique experience. Um, but if we are going to work with an agency that maybe we haven't worked for before, uh, there's a little bit of a sale into why they would want to do mobile. Okay. We, um, the company L4 Digital originally started as L4 Mobile, and companies came to us for mobile, all their mobile products. And that started in about 2007, 2008, we saw iOS, and iPhone and Android launch. Over time, we've seen a lot of companies take on mobile as a, main, as a core product, and they're standing up their own internal teams to do it. We'll consult a little bit, helping them with some best practices, but it's gone inside the organization now. It's a core product for them, and we're seeing a lot of the emerging platforms um, is where we're now getting requests to help with development and productization around, and they're all integrated cross-platform um, cross experiences, but a lot of the mobile stuff is being done by the big brands themselves now. Right. We, we see in our, uh, <coughs> in our consumer survey data uh, that more and more people reach for the phone first. So it's a wireless first, and it's not just millennials, it's 30 year olds and 40 year olds. <coughs> you know, what's the first thing, you, you, you want to do something, you want to find something. Um, you know, what did we ever do before Wikipedia, right? Before Google. But you grab the phone, even though there's a desk, desktop sitting there or a tablet sitting there, you'll grab the phone first. Um, which is interesting because it does change how you guys get to that audience right. and um, you know, what they're going to respond to. So, so. Um, all right, any uh, last chance here? Any questions? Uh, nope. All right. So I've got, I've got one last question for them. And uh, I'm going to start with Andrew, because you, you're going to have to think of a new answer now, because you already gave your first one. Um, so uh, the question is, what keeps you awake at night? And you're not allowed to say, my new dog, my new puppy, my baby, my kids, my teenagers. But rather, what is it that we as an industry, and obviously with mobile video and advertising here, what is it that we're not addressing that's going to come back and bite us in three, four, five years, two years, that is going to be a real issue? So I think what keeps me awake at night is different than the second part of the question, because okay. I think what keeps me awake at night is the opportunity. It's such a sizable opportunity for mobile advertising and mobile video advertising in general. Um, and it ties into the, the negative what keeps me up at night, which is addressing those user concerns around ad blocking, around the quality of the advertising, because uh, it's not trivial. The changes that need to be made are not trivial, and uh, it requires a lot of collaboration amongst the publishers, the developers, the ad tech, the advertisers and marketers. So a lot of players in the space need to work together to solve the problems, um, and it'll, ta it'll take a few years. 
Are we early enough in the process or the industry to still be able to address <coughs> these things, or are we, has it got away from us and it's going to be a problem? No, no, I, it's being addressed. So the IAB put together a council that's addressing it, trying to enact different measures to create better quality of advertising and eliminate some of the issues. So, I mean, it's, it's being worked on, it's underway, but you know, again, it's not trivial, it'll take time. Okay, Brooke? Uh, for me, I would say just constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, we uh, placed some bets on some new exclusive ad units uh, that are directed at you know the millennials, the Gen Zers, and do we make the right bets? Um, what is the next thing, the new different way to interact with those type of or different types of consumers? Okay, and again, same question: Are we are we early enough in this to fix these things? Do you think that we can? Can you stay ahead of the curve, or is it running faster than you, you, your ability to catch it? Yeah, I, I think there's always new and unique ways to advertise. They just don't last long. So it's like figuring out what those are, attacking, doing the best that you can to get it out there. And then as soon as you launch, you're already thinking or halfway developed with the next great idea. So right. just constantly going through that cycle. OK, good. Keith? As digital product consultants, what keeps me up at night is, are we actually tracking the industry, keeping up with the technologies, monitoring the latest innovations, and then making the best recommendations to our clients, because it moves so fast, and there's so many opportunities to do something new, and there's a whole bunch of really smart people in the industry always coming up with something new, and you don't know which one's going to stick. So it becomes this challenge of testing and trying and monitoring. Um, we have a lab in the office where we have you know, people always experimenting with different things just to stay on top of it. But that's what keeps me up at night as you know, we build products for other people. We want to do the best, build the best products we can. And keeping up with it is a challenge. Right. Good. Yeah. And, right. and then as far as catching up, I think it's always going to be an ebb and flow. Um, you know, technology is a wonderful thing. And you see a lot of people over-innovate, I call it, where you come up with it, something that's such a paradigm shift that the industry can't get their arms around how to use it, so it's kind of coming out too early. And then you see the industry catch up, and something that you saw fail three years ago all of a sudden works today. Um, but I think that you'll constantly see this cycle. It's kind of, I call it the, you know, the kind of the innovator's dilemma of, you know, when do you innovate, when do you embrace the current standards, right. and how do you push forward at what pace? So an innovation would have been, like, the smartphone was obviously a very big step, right? And since then, they're all shiny glass blocks. <laughs> we haven't seen another shift since that. Now we're probably seeing it with voice control, Siri, um, uh, the Amazon one, I can't remember the name. Uh, Alexa. Alexa, thank you. Um, and now they've got your earbuds and, uh, yeah. So, but we're, we're starting to see the shift on that one. Is that the type of thing you're talking about? That, I mean, we're talking about ad tech specifically, and I think we're going we're gonna to see a continuous innovation in what's, what ad tech can do and the type of creatives that people can put in front of people and how people can interact with ads, um, the targeting that we talked about and how you make it more relevant and personalized so that people aren't inclined to turn it off or shut the app or install an ad blocker. Yep. All right, great, thank you very much. Good panel, thank you.